to those of you who've joined us um, as panelists and as uh, delegates, dare I call it, use that uh, funny conference word. Uh, so uh, we have been running a series of events as Outdoor Arts UK, which is a, a, a national strategic organisation uh, funded by the Arts Council uh, to support people working in all sorts of areas of the public realm. And uh, as soon as uh, uh, this extraordinary situation reached us, we started working on uh, many initiatives and then most recently we've been reaching out slightly beyond our sector to people to offer advice on how to work outdoors who may not be familiar with it and people uh, we obviously have people who've made careers and lifetimes out of it so we are sharing some of that knowledge also this is an opportunity I know it's a very I know there's lots of uh, friends in the room as well an opportunity to share a bit more knowledge with uh, the actual sector so what uh, we are really thrilled to have is a, is a terrific lineup of very different um, practitioners, uh, artists and experts from the outdoor sector who largely, I hope, are going to offer examples of how uh, they've been working recently or are about to work recently. Uh, just a little bit of background. I, I was at my first outdoor arts event last night in Woolwich, uh, sat on a chair, socially distanced from people I haven't seen, friends uh, and colleagues I haven't seen in five months. Um, looking at a piece that was a memorial piece to uh, people who've lost their lives in COVID, uh, the names of people who had, uh, uh, NHS staff who had worked uh, in the hospital that we could see from where we were sat, who had also lost their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, it was extraordinary to be back out there. And for all the COVIDness, um, what we'd all forgotten about was how horrific the weather can be. And South East London seemed to flood. And I then had an hour and 10 minute cycle in a deluge where people were sandbanking their shops on the way home in Peckham, which was, and Camberwell, it's quite bizarre to see. Yeah, the weather is as, as, as much of a nightmare as always. Uh, so you've just seen our guest there. Um, in the chat window. If anybody else would like to share, um, uh, say hello, if they've just come in, please, of course, use the chat window. I'll just uh, bung up a quick agenda for you all of what we're going to do today. Here we go. Um, we'll finish nice and strictly, I promise, at, uh, at uh, half past 11. Uh, but obviously, I know that people may have other commitments. So dip in and out as you wish. Um, Vicky and Ray will be our first uh, artistic, I call them artistic considerations. Um, speakers. Uh, Ray is coming to us live from the Greenwich and Dockners International Festival site where he's been setting up so we literally have a hands-on view of how things are being adapted there and Vicky, uh, director of Upswing, also will need to go early because she hey, has a funding meeting, can't miss that, uh, but also she has a piece prepared for that so that just to just to let you know that when they slip away they are working and they're not being rude. Um, Reese is going to share with us some of our recent uh, information on audiences. Uh, and how they feel about going back outdoors. Sarah from uh, Wild Rumpus, uh, and quite particularly the Just So Festival is going to talk about some of the producing challenges. Uh, Dan is going to talk about safety, risk and production management. And then we'll have some more um, artistic uh, considerations from Lorna from Gobbledygook Theatre, Matt Pang from Pangotic and Ajay Chabra from Nutcut. So we have a good, uh, good line up there. Very little time for questions. The reason I did that was last time I didn't have that many questions and then they flooded into our inbox. So that's, you're more than welcome to follow up afterwards. And I'll just follow up with some resources and guidance. So a very quick, look, I've, got, I've left myself with um, two minutes. So I'm just gonna give you, uh, for people who are perhaps a little bit new to uh, who we are and what we are doing, I'm just gonna share my screen, always a nightmare. There we go. And that bit where you can't quite see the closed slideshow. Right. There we go. Okay. Well, actually, we've we've done all that. That's uh, that's our little running order there. Um, so this is where I used to work. I was uh, producer of the Watch the Space Festival at the National Theatre for uh, over a decade. Uh, that was, in fact, my first job in the outdoor sector. But it was very interesting to teach me a lot about how an indoor venue can work in the public realm and the different relationships you can have with audiences as well as with artists in that. Uh, it was a great playground for me. We set the building on fire when the Olympic torch came through. Um, people who hate the building were thrilled by that. Um, I, I, was, I love the building, so I was delighted to be able to make it look a little bit different. Um, and it was very pleasing to see that the National, along with many other um, institutions and companies, lit up red to support uh, the events industry, who uh, are also, along with um, some of the more obvious parts of the cultural sector, 
uh, in a very difficult time. Um, outdoor arts takes many different forms, uh, work in the public realm, work in, in commercial festivals, work in high streets as part of business improvement district programs, as part of creative people and places programs, um, many different areas that our artists work in. Uh, this is a French company performing in uh, Great Yarmouth. Uh, there are all sorts of different types of work we can see. This is a, a French dance piece that ended with a holy powder fight, a wonderful uh, jubilant uh, piece of work. This is a company called Occam's Razor who largely work indoors. Circus features a lot in the outdoor realm. Uh, and their most recent show, Belly of a Whale, that's it playing, I think in, I think that's Norwich Cathedral. Um, this was last year's Greenwich and Docklands Festival. Again, a French company performing uh, in very remote areas around Greenwich, uh, different areas there, uh, taking work out into the community. Uh, many of our more traditional artists are buskers. This is Abby Collins, who dances on traffic cones. Who wouldn't book that? Um, then there are the field festivals. This is Green Man. Uh, of course, there's a lot of carnival work that takes place, which has great levels of community engagement. Lots of processional work through town centres. Uh, Mela events take place as part of the outdoor program. Uh, th this is an event, uh, this is part of a show called uh, Fantabulosa, which was drag storytelling for children in the public realm. Lots of walkabout acts, so many acts are static, but obviously many are very mobile, uh, which is an interesting thing in the current climate. Uh, very participatory, this is a piece by Cirque Bijou, uh, which has been uh, at many festivals, but includes a massive element of participation from local communities under those umbrellas. Uh, installation work also features, interesting, again now quite controllable. Um, this was a piece from last year's Greenwich and Docklands. The names you can see on the floor there are written in uh, fluorescent sand, and they're the names of the people who arrived on the first uh, Windrush boat um, next to the Cutty Stark, a really interesting piece of paradoxical programming. Um, then there are, there are lots of companies that tour with sort of small scale performance. Shakespeare, this is uh, Odd Socks. Uh, mods and rockers version of Romeo and Juliet, where I think Juliet was the rocker and Romeo was the mod. Um, and then this is Gobbledygook, we'll be hearing from Lorna later, uh, a piece that has played for a few years. Uh, and then a lot of the old school buskers, God, that's a terrible picture, I didn't that well. That's um, Matt Ricardo, uh, one of our great uh, street jugglers, uh, also uh, with, a, with a kind of fine line in cabaret as well, crosses over. And again, the installations, this is uh, Walk the Planks 5 on. Very, uh, and, and recently, of course, when the government said, you can go back outdoors, they cited the Minac Theatre in Cornwall, which suddenly felt duty bound. And the Minac had been great um, uh, at getting back very, very quickly. What a beautiful setting for outdoor work. Um, just a little bit on who audiences are, just to think slightly beyond the current pandemic reason for perhaps working outdoors. Let's just have a quick run through. This is a report you can get from the audience agency. Um, about who the audiences for outdoor work are. I just think it's a nice little bit of context for us all here. Um, some interesting stats on, on what we know. There's a bit, you'll see a little bit more. There's um, a big social reason uh, that, that drives people uh, as much as for the entertainment, perhaps slightly different. Um, so they come in groups, they are young, and of course there's quite a lot of local audiences. You don't travel in the same way you might travel to see a performance in a venue. Um, and these audiences, gosh, I can hardly see anything on my screen, but I'm going to remember that uh, this, this is about uh, the makeup of our audiences, very youthful and pleasingly diverse. Uh, groups, really important that, that most people come not in twos, but at least in threes. And 61% are returnees, so there is a regular audience for them. So if you happen to be working outdoors for the first time because of COVID, uh, that's an audience you can tap into and bring back, hopefully. Um, and family is very, very important. Social motivation, community cohesion, all stuff you would hope that we were doing if we were working on the streets. We'd be doing it very wrong if we didn't. And um, they seem to be quite happy with the work. Uh, eight out of 10, uh, score, they score us eight out of 10, most of them. Uh, and look at that, I, I think this one's hilarious, is that the West Midlands uh, like us much more than they do in London. So that's hilarious. Um, so you can read that report at the audience agency. Um, it's a piece of work we did uh, with them and many other outdoor organizations across the country. Uh, just a bit on our resources. This is, a, I will give you the links to this later. Um, we've been holding lots of resources, the practical guidance for how to get back outdoors, um, including our booking guides and our directories of consultants that you may wish to draw upon. 
uh, we'll be hearing from some of those today. This is our uh, bookable shows guide, which is constantly being updated with shows that are ready to go. I'm pleased to be looking and see that Ray Lee is in there and Lorna is in there. Uh, we'll be hearing from them very shortly. And then quite importantly, we're keeping a very strict eye on what is going on. So this is from our um, listings page on our website. As soon as we hear that something is going ahead, we're listing it there and that can be live or online. Because of course, many, many things have transferred to online uh, initiatives. Anything to add to any of that or to ask us any questions, come to info at Outdoor Arts. That's enough from me. Um, I will share all that. So um, what I would like to do is hand over firstly to uh, Vicky Amedame from Upswing Aerial, who will talk a bit particularly about the piece called Catch Me, which we'll be playing at uh, Greenwich and Docklands very, very shortly. And then we'll go to Ray to hear about what he's been doing with his installation work. Can I hand over to you, Vicky? Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you. I have unmuted myself. Excellent. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm Vicky Madami and I'm Artistic Director of Upswing. And Upswing is a contemporary circus and performance company and we create work that authentically represents a rich, diverse world. And we aim to tell new stories in extraordinary ways. So we work in theatres and festivals, but we also perform in streets, parks, libraries, in care homes. Um, we take shows to meet people in the places where they live, work and play. And we've been working um, in the outdoors for I think over 15 years now. Um, in March 2020, <laughs> March this year, we were set for a very, very busy year. We had a tour of our indoor work in China, we were developing a large scale participatory project for children and families in Brent libraries. Um, we had a new project in six care homes in London and we were just about to tour our most recent piece of outdoor work called Catch Me across the UK. Catch Me, um, oh Reese, can I have my first image please? Thank you. So Catch Me is a duet between an older white woman and a young black man. And the piece is about how these very, very different bodies and people occupy public space, how they're seen, who is seen as powerful, who is seen as vulnerable. And the piece aims to question the immediate judgments that we make of these bodies and reveal other possibilities. Um, it's a piece that works with intimacy and touch and physical contact and lots of lifts between the performers. And in the early stages of the pandemic, for me, the idea of going back into creation for any of this work seemed impossible. You know, circus is a very physical art form and the focus of our practice as a company has always been about creating ensemble work, bringing bodies together in dynamic action. Um, I was struggling because it seemed like the tools that I used to create were no longer usable in the current circumstance. Um, and in response, we started a process called Slow Thinking, which was a space that we opened up to bring other circus artists and makers together to reflect on the challenges that we were facing. And talking to other practitioners really helped give me a bit of courage and remember that the skills we work with are a set of tools and that we needed to push forward to explore how we could use those tools and use our practice in this environment or you know waiting for things to change was not really an option during lockdown i had a few creative sessions with the cast uh, to consider how we could work within the limitations that we were working with and some new ideas emerged about how we could explore the theme of intimacy at a distance. And I have a, an image from the new version of Catch Me. Excellent. Um, so we've, we've incorporated the use of these perspex screens on stage as a way to bring the performers, uh, you know, within touching distance, but still kind of have a degree of separation between them. Um, on a practical level for us as a company, we had no option but to think about how we could work with social distancing in place. Our performers' lifestyles and our touring structures mean that creating and touring in a bubble is not really practical or often not even possible for us as a company. Going back into rehearsals, um, 
ahead of the rehearsal process, we had a, a, a meeting with our performers to talk about the measures that we were going to put into place. We had spent a lot of time uh, reviewing the government guidelines to inform the choices that we made. You know, everything from the choice of venue and space that we were working in, uh, finding an appropriately ventilated space to allow us to have the cast and the crew that we needed, um, working in a fixed team. So for the first time, it was a closed door rehearsal process and other members of the upswing team were not able to visit us and see the work. Um, we put in place arrival protocols and cleaning schedules and hand sanitizations. We had uh, masks within the rehearsal process and a lot of choreographic restrictions that we had to work around to enable us to kind of make the work. Laying down these rules and structures was hard. It felt like we were introducing a formality into the space that would have an impact on the freedom that we had to play to rediscover what Catch Me was and to adapt it for this new circumstance. But our duty of care for the people that we work with was clear. It was important before we entered the rehearsal room to explain the choices that we were making to the cast and to listen to them and agree together the way that we could work in the best possible, um, best possible structure for them. Once everybody had agreed to a way of working, I, I have to admit that sticking to it was hard. Distancing protocols felt like a new skill that we had to practice. It felt particularly odd when leaving a rehearsal room, we would be walking down the street towards the station in Deptford and walking past bars full of people drinking and socialising in a way that there was very little appearance of social distancing. As well as the physical safety protocols we put in place, we had to consider our emotional and our creative safety. After months and months of being at home uh, and struggling with the various changes and challenges that we've all had to deal with, both professional and personal, going back to work was not easy. Not only had uh, we lost some physical stamina, but I think we'd also all lost some mental stamina and the headspace for creation. Um, we realized when we were setting up the rehearsal process to allow for the uh, time that we would need for the practical safety considerations, realizing that they would slow down rehearsals. But we'd also realized we needed to allow ourselves some time for the emotional and mental adjustments of returning to work, taking frequent breaks and having regular check-ins with the team so that we could exercise some empathy for the different levels of anxiety that everybody in the room was carrying. Um, we gave ourselves 10 days to rebuild the work, knowing that we had uh, some language between us uh, as a core team. The two performers that I was working with on the show, Jerome and Susan, had spent a lot of time together and we felt that we had a good understanding and rapport and working relationship. Um, and we were hoping that we would be able to ad simply adapt the show that we had and uh, take out sections that were in close contact and involved lifting and acrobatic movement and replace them with, with something else. But as we were working, we found that what we were really doing was we were making a completely new piece of work. Um, we'd allowed ourselves 10 days uh, thinking that we would have the space to make this adaptation and kind of deal with the extra stretch um, that, that we'd need to have to deal with the COVID proofing and the safety proofing that we needed in the room. We quickly found out that that was um, a real underestimation of the time that we needed. Fortunately, they're a brilliant team and we were able to generate material very, very quickly. But I would urge anybody going into rehearsal at this time to factor in um, at least a third more time than you anticipate. Normally when I'm creating choreography, I'm expecting that I'll be able to make uh, one minute of clean material a day. So 10 days for a 10 minute piece felt like it was generous. But we quickly realized actually, um, we, we would need more time. 
fortunately, you know, having that basis of understanding between us, we were able to make something that we were really, really proud of in that time. But I would urge anybody to kind of expand your uh, expand your vision about how much time you actually need to work. Um, the main compromise that, that we experienced in the creation process was having to let go of skills, working practices and materials that we all felt safe with. Um, we were working from a piece of work that was already in existence. And there was a time over the first couple of days where we were mourning what we couldn't do which really held us back from realizing actually the opportunities of the new materials that we had to work with you know how we could uh, play with the new materials that we had in the space um, so going through that process of kind of mourning what was lost took some time uh, but there was a brilliant moment where we just kind of let go of everything that had come before and just tried to work from the principles, the ideas, the core of the work and discover something new. So we essentially made a completely new piece of work. Um, I'm really keen to be able to get back to working with touch and physical contact in the future. But what we have discovered in that this time, I think, is really, really strong. Uh, working practices and new ideas that will definitely be incorporated in and it will enrich uh, the original version of Catch Me. So those are my main points. I can see some questions have popped up in the chat. Angus, is it okay for me to answer any questions? Yeah, uh, dive in there. I mean, really uh, strongly, it, it is great that you've talked about uh, how, how emotionally difficult it has been as well as practically I, I can well understand that um, and I think it's really worth wearing in mind and actually giving yourself that bit of extra time for just that is is a really really good takeaway um, as well as that um, so anything else you want to comment on there Vicky because I know we're going to yeah, let you I know. Think, I think the anxiety question was was really interesting you know um, we all go into the rehearsal room with with a degree of anxiety but quite often we're working in a context where we know the challenges that we're going to experience. And for us, this process was about entering a room where we were really in unknown territory um, and being able to do it with the team that I'd worked with before, um, that we had a degree of trust in um, going with the process made it possible. Great, that's fantastic. Uh, so you're, when, when's it went on? So we are performing on the 5th of September at Greenwich and Docklands Festival. We're in Dancing City, which is on the Canary Wharf site. Um, I haven't got in my head the, the performance times, but uh, Dancing City is uh, a, a trail of multiple performances across the day. And my advice is if you're going, arrive early because there's a limited audience um, and it will be first come, first served. Lovely. Well, I will see you on my bike with my mask on. Thank you. Uh, there, hopefully. Great. Thank you so very much, Vicky. That's really, really helpful. I'm going to move on, if I may, now to Ray, who I think we still have live. I can see, see Greenwich looking fantastic. Um, so Ray is uh, a, a, an artist I've worked with in the past who uh, creates these wonderful walkthrough sound sculptures. And uh, he's about to, in, well, he's installing them as we speak in Greenwich. So we'll see what we do in terms of connectivity here. But Ray, can I hand over to you? Hi, everyone. Fantastic to be uh, live from the Greenwich and Docklands Festival down at the old Royal Naval College. It's a bit windy. So if you, if you get a bit of wind noise, I'm sorry about that. Also, if you if I start breaking up, then just shout and tell me and I'll try and pick up from wherever I was. So first of all, it's amazing to be actually out doing something and of course it being outdoor arts it apps as angus was saying it absolutely um poured with rain last night at the moment it's lovely and sunny fantastic and i think in about an hour's time it's going to rain again so we're making the absolute most of of this little uh break in the weather to enjoy it so thinking about uh approaching kind of going back into doing work again actually I was really nervous about the whole thing on one hand it's amazing to be offered the work and thank you very much uh, Greenwich and Dockers Festival for, for putting this on 
but there is a huge amount of work as, as Vicky was saying, in terms of preparing and thinking about it. So I had to do quite an extensive uh, COVID risk assessment, uh, thinking through how uh, we would approach um, the management of the get-in, thinking about the audience experience, things like that. I would also have to say that Greenwich have been totally on top of it. So we're on site now, we're installing, I'm not currently wearing a mask, although I should be, but that's in case anyone needs to lip read. But everyone else, all the crew, all the crew are masked up. <laughs> we have a, an extremely uh, unsocial distance gathering going on there, but that's kind of inevitable, really. We are working together, we're trying to get the thing done. So on one hand, you're planning to do something, you're thinking, yes, we'll keep social distance, that's fine, we won't share any tools, we'll make sure everything's disinfected. The other side of it is the show's on tonight at half past seven. So we've got to get it up. We've got to get it ready. So you're working with those two kind of, um, those, those two uh, imperatives. One is to keep everyone safe. The other is the show must go on. So we're kind of making it up as we go along, as is everyone else. Chorus, as you can see, consists of a series of large tripods. We're installing 14 of them in this fantastic site. I'm really thrilled to be able to put the work here. The tripods are, go over towards the team again. Uh, we, we erect them to their full height. So they start off like this and they go up to about four and a half, five and a half meters tall. Sound comes out, is emitted from the loudspeakers on the top, you can see the horns, and those arms rotate so the audience move around through a rotating sound field of drones. And my aim is to create a mesmerizing hypnotic experience. And I guess thinking about the audience was relatively straightforward for me because this piece is designed so that people can walk around in their own time, in their own space and create their own journey through the piece, both visually and orally. So, I guess that's why I got the gig, really, because already the work is kind of set up for some kind of social distancing. And I was thinking about the kinds of uh, choices that people have to make when they are thinking about their own work. So we're going to be in this situation for some time to come. So clearly situations where an audience has to gather in one place to watch something are going to be more difficult. But maybe there are opportunities to think slightly more laterally, to think about disrupting a, a linear narrative, thinking more like installations. What kind of experience can you give an audience which is true to the work that you do, but which does not necessarily require them to be sat in a kind of conventional audience uh, manner? Artistically, again, it's not, um, I haven't really had to change this piece very much. This is a big site. And normally, um, I would imagine that we could get about 500 people in here comfortably, 500 people, maybe more, without, again, it being desperately crowded. Uh, Greenwich have limited the audience to 80 people per performance, which is, again showing how seriously they're taking it because they want this to happen it's really in incredibly important that it happens without any problems so there'll be a, a relatively small audience for a piece on this scale the the other thing about the artistic consideration is funnily enough is my main thought was should i take the gig and again following up on what was said before because you're worried about, I was worried about myself, I was worried about my team, I was worried about the audience. Is it possible to do something like this safely? And you go through the risk assessment, you imagine it's going to be done in a certain way, you turn up and then you think, yeah, okay, we're doing the best we can, but it's still not a straightforward, um, it's not a straightforward process. And the other side of it is that there are no guarantees. The gig could be cancelled. You know, we've all been through the process of this year of 
entire year's worth of work just being cancelled. It was like a set of nine pins, just gig after gig after gig, just got cancelled. So when these turned up as a possibility, it was like, well, amazing, fantastic. Let's see what happens. Um, I was supposed to go to Austria next week to do another show. They were incredibly confident that it could happen. Um, I'd freighted the work out there, booked the flights, and then Austria went onto the quarantine list. So that's not possible. So there are no guarantees. So in terms of preparation, thinking about your contract is actually really important. Again, Greenwich have been incredibly good. Um, within a month of this piece, uh, the, the date for this piece, uh, if it had to be cancelled, then they were going to pay 50%. So things like that mean that you can approach the possibility of doing these works without, um, without thinking that if it falls through, you're going to be left completely penniless. But there is always the possibility that at any stage, these gigs could just be cancelled. And that's probably the way it's going to be for some time to come. That's about all I've got to say. Are there any, any thoughts that you would like to come in on before I go and get on with what I'm supposed to be doing? Ray, thank you so much for doing this live from on site. I feel like we've, we've beaten the BBC today in, in, in a live from Greenwich moment. It's amazing. Thank you also for your honesty about how it looks on paper to how it is in reality. I think it's really, really important point for all of us to, to know and understand that. And I think the other question about contracts, that's at the moment, I'm as an organization and as individuals, we're also focused on how the hell do we just get out and do this stuff safely and within the right measures. Contracts is the next big thing. And I'm, I'm largely thinking for next year. Um, I think we're scrabbling to find a way now. Brilliant to hear though that, that GDIF have been so responsible. Ray, we're gonna go and let you, we're gonna let you work. Thank you so much. Fingers okay, crossed for the weather. Um, and I will see you in a mask at some point uh, over there. The other thing I've learned is that even people that you know really well, it's quite hard to recognize them with half a face. I didn't know until <laughs> yesterday. So um, don't be afraid of saying, sorry, who are you? Uh, and that will be fine. Ray, thank you very much. We'll, we'll okay, leave you bye. to get on. Brilliant. Great. That was amazing. Um, and Vicky, you're now bathed in sunlight. So our speakers uh, who are leaving us are doing, doing really well with, with the weather. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, move on. Rhys, you're going to give us, well, look, I've overrun. It's my fault entirely. So, Rhys, you're going to give us the fastest uh, view of the, um, the, this is the halfway stage findings of our Getting Back Outdoors audience survey. The next, uh, we closed the survey about a week ago, and the next uh, installment of the final results will be available on the 11th. Rhys, what do we know so far? Indeed, a hard act to follow being in my bedroom from Greenwich, but it's fine. So, uh, yep, so anyone that perhaps hasn't thought about making outdoor work before, this is just to give you a brief overview of what some of our audiences are thinking at the moment. So as Angus said, this was taken at the midway point of the survey. So this is for data from last July, and that's what the responses are based on. Um, so at the moment, for what we understand before we get the final report, 8% of people are missing attending outdoor arts events, which I think is a huge seal of approval for uh, the sector. Uh, so if you've never worked in outdoor arts, there's definitely a love and a passion out there for it. 75% uh, are looking forward to attending the buzz of being at a live event. We asked uh, lots of people what the, were their favourite things about attending outdoor events and this by far was the thing that outweighed all the rest. Um, the one that definitely was the least popular was being in close proximity to lots of people. Um, so in terms of, uh, for those that maybe haven't worked in outdoor arts before, quite a lot of the festivals or the setups that outdoor work uh, takes part in are actually free festivals or free settings. Um, and actually what we discovered was that 98% of people were willing to pay or donate to attend events in the future. So audiences absolutely recognise that there's a cost and a value to the work. So if you're thinking about making work for the, set, uh, for the first time, don't necessarily think that the work that you've got to make has to be free. 78% uh, would attend with a appropriate safety measures in place. We've heard what some of those things are already today from Vicky and Ray, um, but you know, absolutely. Um COVID measures are really important for public facing events. And some of those particular events that people were more interested in attending were drive-in performances, open air theatres and plays and rural and countryside festivals. Um, the, the sort of the, the data that we were looking at made us realize that these were things that people could see were going ahead. Um, so drive-in performances, as we know, have sort of been, uh, have been quite prevalent in the sector as have sort of open air theatre that Manak, as Angus said earlier, and plays. And we've seen some really creative interpretations 
versions of that we've seen you know people doing uh shakespeare at a cricket ground uh, a play in a pub garden we've seen stuff on bikes we've seen lots of different uh creative ways people doing silent discos with individual headphones lots of different ways um audiences feel less comfortable with only by a small margin those things um but it feels like as uh you know uh, Greenwich and Docklands Festival have, has many of those things. Large scale installation, that's exactly what we've just heard from about Ray. Uh, safety and hygiene measures. So things that people felt would make them feel most comfortable were hand sanitizer, on site cleaning, and careful management of toilet facilities. So just really thinking about that personal hygiene was the main thing for audiences. Uh, so that's absolutely something to think about in terms of where you're presenting your work. Um, and physical space management. So it's not just about the hygiene, it's about how you uh, run your event, it's how you work with your festival, your presentation partner to be able to deliver that. So one way systems, separate entrances and exits, uh, demarcation areas, and strict social distancing were things that uh, would make people feel more comfortable, um, which is great. Uh, Naturally, we were really interested in finding out whether or not people were interested in uh, traveling to go to outdoor events. Um, you know, when you've got a building, it's sort of quite obvious that you've got to travel to the building. But with outdoor, we have flexibility over where we program our work. Um, so nine out of 10 people felt comfortable attending local events, uh, which was sort of in their area. And we sort of figured out it was about one to 50 people. Uh, naturally, a lot less people felt comfortable attending huge events. So think Glastonbury, think Latitude. Um, people weren't keen on those. So it, there's definitely a sense that staying local, staying within a sort of safe traveling distance was something that people were interested in. Um, but naturally, that doesn't also mean that people were only willing to sort of stay within their town or city. You know, 65% of people definitely said that they were willing to travel regionally. Uh, and uh, modes of transport that they were particularly interested in taking uh, were, were walking or um, cycling or taking cars. So there was a sort of natural leaning away from public transport. So thinking about who can access your event and how easy it is for them to get to it in covid times is really important uh yep you can't get involved today <laughs> um but if you would like to know more then as Anga said our report will be released in early september and that'll be a fuller detailed report as well uh that was four minutes nailed it brilliant thank you reese that's really useful to know thank you very much um now talking of beautiful toilets we're going to talk about the just so festival uh with Royal Rumpus. I, I'm a townie, so I find it, I, it's always a challenge for me to go to a field festival, but I can always guarantee that when I go to um, a Wild Rumpus event, the toilets will be immaculate. So this is not a COVID thing. This is just for me in every possible time. This is how I judge a festival. Um, forget the quality of work, forget the art. Um, so Sarah, how very nice of you to join us today um, and to talk a little bit about what your thinking is now, just so you'll explain, I'm sure, is, is a family-friendly Greenfield Festival um, that uh, last year I attended and it was it was mud central and you, you, you had to all the usual things. Now you've got this whole additional thing to deal with. So I wonder if you'd share your current thinking on some of that. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, oh, do you know, it's so lovely to be back in a world where we're talking about bad weather again, as opposed to COVID. It felt like, it felt like we'd forgotten how bad the weather was in the UK. Um, I'm in a very rainy Macclesfield and we've got some outdoor gigs happening in our woods today. Um, so yeah, it's all about the rain. Um, but Wild Rumpus, I'm one of the directors of Wild Rumpus. We're based in uh, Cheshire on the Cheshire Staffordshire border and uh, we work from a woodland. Uh, we put on uh, a variety of festivals and events, a couple of weekend camping festivals, Timber, which is in the National Forest, which celebrates trees and forests, and uh, Just So, which Angus mentioned, which is a family festival in Cheshire, uh, which also happens in Brazil, uh, New Zealand, and was to launch in the US this year, but uh, sadly not to be. Um, we are... Um, we get a little bit of project funding from the Arts Council, but we're not a regularly funded organisation. So most of our income comes from tickets or from commissions from environment and conservation charities. So we do a big project with Chester Zoo for their Christmas lanterns uh, experience, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, so uh, yes, and we've opened up our, while we've been cancelling events this summer, um, and uh, putting our staff on furlough and trying to communicate with lots of people while having no resources. We've uh, now brought some people, some of our team, there are 14 of us work here around for Wild One Person. We've brought some of the team back from furlough to put on some small social 
socially distanced events at our woods, which has been an interesting uh, chance to test out some of our kind of COVID mitigation plans for uh, the bigger Chester Zoo event and then also for the festivals next year. So things like yoga, tree climbing, uh, I mentioned some gigs that we've got happening today, outdoor cinema, that kind of thing. And um, everything has taken longer. We're, <laughs> I think we're all a little bit like rabbit caught, caught, caught headlights. We're like, oh, normally we put on an event for 5,000 people. And now having 50 people come feels like it's more scary and intimidating. So that's a bit weird. Um, it's a lot more comms, a lot more managing expectations of the audience, much clearer communication to them. You know, we'd be emailing everybody a week in advance, reminding them of what their kind of on-site etiquette and behaviours are, you know, remembering to bring you um, masks, remembering uh, to use the hand gel, all those kind of things, uh, while trying not to suck out all of the magic and spontaneity and excitement of being outdoors. and. Um, I totally, uh, it, was, it was lovely to hear Vicky and May talking about a lot of the anxiety. I think I'm being aware of the fact that everybody's in very different places from the staff to any contractors or performers, um, as well as the difference between what you've written in that risk assessment and how things actually play out in reality, which, um, yeah, we had, uh, we decided to have a camp out the other night at our woods for uh, some of our supply chain, some of our contractors, the uh, freelancers and the power guys and some of the caterers. And um, it's weird, actually, if you've been working with people for 10 years on and off and you haven't seen them for quite a long time, then it doesn't matter how many emails you send telling people what the one way system is or how we're going to socially distance on site they just want to hug each other <laughs> and and that's a weird thing if you're the person who's convened that gathering you know what it feels really weird like when do you stop in and tell people to stop hugging each other and to step away it's, yeah bizarre um but anyway in amongst all the cancelling reforecasting of our plans um and delivering some of these alternative events. Uh, we've been looking a lot more at the kind of resilience of us as an organisation um, and pulling together a bit more of a risk register and it's been quite a good time to do that. So looking at things like the sustainability of our supply chain, I guess we felt a lot more interconnected. You realise that how many cogs there are in the machine that pull events together and so that it's yeah the artists and the organization the festival programmers but then it is all about the power the tents the food vendors the guys in the car park and you realize how very very connected you are and how much responsibility there is for you all to help each other and make sure that that supply chain comes out the other side intact so a lot of conversations with our supply chain obviously thinking about our different funding streams we've done a little bit of crowdfunding um thinking a lot about audience confidence. I think it's been really interesting seeing the messages that play out to DCMS where everybody's going, our sector's in really great danger. But really, it's not in that big a danger. So audiences buy a ticket for next year's festival. So it's a really kind of nuanced message that I think is quite tricky um, to, to balance. Um, a lot about insurance and contracts. And it's interesting to hear Ray talk about uh, GDIF's contracts. Um, and that shared risk uh, that we all need to take now. Um, we've been looking at things like equity. We're part of an, an um, we're lucky enough to be part of a number of networks where people are sharing best practice and knowledge and experience. So, without walls, but also big imaginations, which is a children's and family touring con um, theatre consortium in the Northwest um, and talking to people about exactly what insurance and contracts they're putting in place so that we can share the risk. But there is a massive risk, you know, we're, we've, we've got to be financially viable. And so, yeah, we're, we're going into this huge Chester Zoo project with kind of 50 performers and uh, 20 freelancers, knowing that at any minute that might be canceled. So it's, yeah, just how much exposure you can take financially. Um, is a tricky balance. Um, 
But then also try not to get too bogged down in that, because every time we get bogged down in the detail of insurance and contracts, then we think, actually, we need to use this time right now as a catalyst to think of new ways of working and um, how we can innovate. And um, yeah, we, it, it, it feels like a really exciting time as well. And, and the more bogged down in the detail, I think the less we can see that. Um, and on that, I'll just uh, take a moment to take a bit of a plug for, um, we're running a sustainable environmental sustainability symposium with without walls on the 21st of september um i haven't got a link for it uh right now uh, the details are coming out next week of all the speakers but hopefully that is a bit of a chance to um step back and think about different ways of working and imagining uh more environmentally sustainable futures uh, so that's online on the 21st of September um, with regards to our festival programs for 2021 I guess the biggest problem uh, problem well it's a difficulty certainly is that there's a lack of room for new programming um, it's I think I don't know how much we're talking about it as an industry but the majority of festivals are rolling program over to from 2020 to 2021 it's certainly what we've done we've honored all of the contracts for artists from this year and it means that there's a there's not very much space in that programming for new work and it feels like a time for new work and work that speaks to the moment that we're in um so yeah that's a really hard balance that I'm not sure how we're going to address. We're trying to find different and new ways of working. So we've been lucky to have a bit of PRS funding for the first time. And they're asking some musicians to respond to a global forest sound map that we pulled together. But yeah, I think it's trying to find, create new spaces within the programme. Um, that will be interesting. Um, practically, we're thinking about how we can raise things up off the ground so that people can step back and have more visibility. Um, and we're taking things out of tents, which of course means that we're worried about the weather again. Um, and also thinking about how we can repeat performances during, uh, so do put things on uh, more often with smaller numbers um, so that they can have a slightly more intimate audience. Uh, we're thinking logistically and, uh, and expenditure wise about the cost of increased welfare facilities uh, for audiences, but also for performers as well. Um, so some of this is stuff that we're trialing with uh, our project at Chester Zoo. Um, so Chester Zoo is a trail which takes place over six weeks for a, an audience of about 100,000. Uh, it's a lantern illuminated costumes trail. There's about 50 performers and other 20 makers. So we're thinking about how we can bubble performers so that if one performer go, uh, presents with symptoms, the whole cast don't go down um, or have to be isolating. Um, and also we've moved the number of nights so instead of 19 nights it's going to be 25 nights so a slightly reduced audience each night uh, but yeah thinking about equipment and making sure we've got duplicates of everything so people don't have to share equipment at all uh, thinking about changing spaces and rooms for breaks and having to create all that space um so it's yeah it's a handy it's handy for us because we can test a lot of things out that might or might need to not need to be implemented on the festivals next year um in terms of guidance as i say we're sharing with other peers in the sector but we're also the um events industry federation the eif have got some guidance that was updated on the 24th of august um and they're they're the people who update the purple guide they manage the purple guide for health and safety and they're updating that in line with government guidelines so it's worth keeping an eye on that um and yeah maybe the last thing to say is just reflecting what reese was talking about in terms of the survey is that we um having cancelled all of this year's festivals uh and asked everybody to roll their tickets over we found that about 80 percent of our audiences rolled their tickets over to next year's events um but there's definitely we've just put tickets back on sale for next year for 2021 and they're there's definitely an appetite they're selling really well probably even better than they would in a normal year which i think reflects people's thirst for wanting to 
get back to doing stuff and also potentially people thinking longer term about the fact that they might not be holidaying abroad next year and so they're looking for stuff that's going to be happening in the UK so uh, I think that speaks to that confidence but also that ability to potentially you know mitigate some of the financial risk by charging the public to see work as well because they are prepared to pay for it as was shown in the um in the findings and i think that's it from me thanks sarah that's really useful to hear that there's a question there i wonder if you just pick up ruth's question about when you're honoring uh, contracts have you changed the payment schedule to reflect that if they're going ahead a year particularly um are you changing the original payment schedule to reflect the change time of delivery uh a little bit i mean it's all we're, we're doing everything on a kind of um one-to-one -one basis so we're just in a dialogue with people about how 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 things will work best for them Um, we're quite lucky in terms of the fact that because we work with some bigger organizations like chester zoo and the national forest they have been able to honor their payments to us and bring forward staged payments so that we can honor our payments to other people so yeah it's a bit of a one-to-one -one with people as to what works best for them but we're, we're trying our best to yeah finding our way which i think is interesting I, what you also say about this being a time for change and an exciting time in many ways I also think we can't force it. We, you know, we, we, we change will have to happen in order to, to function. Um, and it, it's not going to happen overnight. So it's, it, but it's great to know that you're, you're part of that. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Um, speakers, I'm sorry, I'm running a bit late. So I'm going to ask you all to power through. Um, we're going to talk now, uh, quite importantly, about production management, safety and risk. I'm going to hand over to Dan. I'm a big fan of uh, health and safety. I'm a big fan of really good method statements. Uh, it's how you get this work done safely at the best of times, as weatherproof as it can possibly be. And now COVID proof, my God, there are more things that we have to take on board. Dan, may I hand over to you? Thank you very much, uh, Angus, and good morning, everyone. Good to be with you this morning. Um, and great to hear what those other speakers have been uh, mentioning. I'll try not to double up on what's already been said um, and to cover as much as I can in, in a short space of time. So, um, I'm Dan Lake. I'm a freelance event production manager focusing on arts and community work. I work for Brighton Festival. So anything that's outdoors in Brighton Festival, uh, you'll encounter me um, as a host organisation. But I also work a lot with, uh, with other companies such as Same Sky in Brighton, where we're taking work and visiting um, for other festivals, visiting other sites um, and touring work as well. So all sides of the, of the industry. Um, really interesting to get from the other speakers that this is a, a very, very challenging time. And at the same time, um, you know, there's, there's a genuine opportunity there. And it's certainly my experience of going back and seeing, uh, seeing work, seeing visiting sites where there's stuff being performed, how excited people are just to be getting together and, and seeing stuff. It's, it's a fantastic feeling to be coming with built that way as human beings and we want to come together uh, socially distanced or not it is a um it's something that we all want to be doing and i think the audiences are there and ready and in a lot of ways with the problems that we have around venues the outdoor sector has a massive opportunity to show ourselves and and uh, what we can what we can offer um there is a lot of guidance out there um if if you're new to the to outdoor work, then Sarah's mentioned the Purple Guide. Um, you can subscribe to that for £25 a year, um, and it's got all the guidance that you need and lots of references to, to other um, health and safety executive published works for, for, for detailed stuff. But that's a really great place to start. Sarah's also mentioned the Event Industry Forum. Um, that document is called Keeping Workers and Audiences Safe during COVID-19. And as Sarah said, it's been updated on 24th of August. So um, you want to be checking in and looking at that. Um, and the Outdoor Arts Resources page is fantastic. There's a lot on there, including templates uh, for risk assessments. Um, yeah, so new types of work are going to be coming up. And um, in the outdoor sector, production people working with uh, creative people in very close collaboration, that's the way forwards. Uh, we are by nature in the outdoor sector very collaborative and it can seem like there's this huge wave of guidance that there is to follow don't be alone in trying to plow through that and creating your own risk assessments 
reach out to other companies that are doing something similar to you, uh, collaborate, use your networks. Um, and with risk assessment in particular, it's not something where um, you want to be doing that on your own. You should be talking to your company, talking to the people who will be carrying out the work, consulting, finding out from them what's going to work and what doesn't work, as well as following guidelines. Uh, collaboration is the key, as, as Vicky has alluded to. Um, it may be quite a lot of companies uh, going down the, the route of actually nominating somebody who is a safety advisor, but more perhaps a health advisor. Um, when we're doing all the standard things which all other businesses are doing about track and trace, are we going to register people as they start work? Are you going to stagger start time so that we avoid crowding at entrances? Um, we need to be recording who is working and when, and we need to have contacts for those. We need to be doing all the standard stuff now about hand washing and hygiene. And the challenge is there is not really understanding and the knowledge of that. It's really how do you make sure that that happens? It's the rigor with w which is necessary now uh, to make those things happen. And that's really about leadership and right from the get go, um, embodying those those principles and making sure that that social distancing happens as much as possible. Um, briefing meetings can happen online. They don't have to be uh, at the, you know, uh, at traditionally on the morning of the first day of getting everybody gathers together. It's your huddle before you go out and start the work. Well, that needs to happen in advance. Um, a lot of these things have been happening anyway. It's kind of movements that have been happening in the industry and this moves us forward. Um, and kind of make sure that that stuff is, is going to be happening more. Even things like unloading vans, you want to be using, uh, avoiding people working in close proximity wherever that's possible. So you're using lifting equipment, which is good standard practice already. Um, and this just further helps us to, to move in that direction. Um, we've talked, uh, Vicky talked about uh, one-way systems, um, we can use ground markings. There's all sorts of methods there. And a lot of that is in the guidance. But chiefly, I think it's really thinking creatively and uh, working together to consider different ways of, of doing things. So with Same Sky, for example, we have two annual parades. Um, the Children's Parade has 5,000 people right through the center of uh, Brighton uh, shutting streets. You know, it's just not gonna happen uh, next May. So. How do, we, how do you make that happen? Burning the clocks, a winter solstice lantern parade in the middle of, of winter, 2,000 people going through the centre of Brighton with a huge fire and fireworks um, display down on the beach. Again, not going to happen. But taking the heart of what that is, how can we make something go on? So it really is about the, taking the participation elements of those, those events and making sure that people can go ahead and make lanterns. Maybe they display them in their front windows at, at home now. Maybe we can work with the businesses in Brighton and uh, display a lantern trail in the shop windows of, of creative shops around Brighton. Work in partnership with, uh, with new people, reach out to the commercial sector, reach out to, to shops and town centres which are struggling. Um, there are lots of empty shops opening up. It's terrible, but at the same time, that it does represent uh, an opportunity. How can we look to move into new areas um, and support other, other sectors. Um, there are many ways of controlling risk. So your risk assessments, you will need to have a, a COVID risk assessment. Um, there, are, there is a template on the Outdoor Arts resource page. Um, work with others to do that. But you're never looking to copy and paste a, a, a risk assessment template is a planning document you want to be using that to really talk through how you're going to tackle specific areas within within your production um, and that can be about social distancing but it's about much more so in Brighton Festival we've had a simple act of wonder a fabulous piece by Walter and Zanil it involves a grass painting in uh, one of the suburbs of, of Brighton uh, and one of the ways that we've been con safety control on that is to do with marketing. It's simply about how you put out your messaging to the public. Who do you let know about that? And what's the timing of that? So keeping it very local for the first week, 
seeing what lo how local audiences behave, looking at those huge um, grass paintings across acres of grassland, uh, and then putting out the publicity wider across the city, then putting out the publicity to, to national press. Um, so it's yeah, about lateral thinking, it's about thinking of different ways of tackling things. And certain types of production are more suited uh, to this new reality that, than others. With Robin Morley working on an event called Illuminated Leonardsley, we have a, a nighttime trail through the woods. And actually people are, tend to be socially, quite socially distanced and within their social bubbles when they would do that anyway. So the focus becomes much more about how you communicate with those audiences. Clear and consistent messaging is just vital. And if you're selling tickets, you have an opportunity to, to talk with that audience, to assure them about their, that we're going to be looking after them, that you're going to be safe at this uh, event, that we want to work with you. Um, you it's, we talk a lot about we speak. We're working with uh, Dr. Chris Cocking, who's a crowd dynamics specialist. And it's their way of including the audience and bringing them in to be part of your safety management rather than dictating uh, rules. If you tell somebody not to touch their face, the instinct is instantly to touch your face. Um, whereas if you give the positive instruction of uh, please try and keep your hands below your shoulders, it's just a different way of suggesting. So it's thinking very carefully about them, the messaging um, and being clear and consistent in, in that way. Um, yeah, I don't want to overrun. I'm aware that we're, uh, we're pressured for time. So um, uh, use the resources that there are uh, um, outdoor arts. There are plenty of uh, production managers out there looking for work uh, and use your networks. That's my main message. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dan. And I, I, I think really interesting to hear that focus on communications. Uh, a bit referring to uh, what Sarah was also saying about managing audience expectations. So important. Uh, and that was certainly my experience yesterday. Um, really interesting. Uh, while this has been going on, uh, Exeter Street Arts uh, Festival tomorrow has been cancelled. And so I'm just undoing all the tweets about it. Uh, so it's very much a live situation when we look at that. I don't know if that's because of the weather or because of COVID. I don't know. Um, right, three more artistic responses. Um, I'm sorry we're running a bit late, so I'm going to ask uh, Lorna, Matt and Ajay to power through to the end of this with a little bit of um, what you've learned. So we'll start, if we may, uh, with Lorna. Hi, uh, everybody. Um, I'm just going to put this on. Sorry. Can everyone see that? Yep, good. Is that fully screen sharing? Sorry. Uh, no, but we can see it. <laughs> Apologies. Play from start, Lorna. There you Play go. from start. That's it. Hi, everybody. My name's Lorna. Um, I am performance artist. I run Gobbledygook Theatre. Like so many of our stuff was cancelled this year. We're a bit heartbroken about. Um, we are also arts activists. We do lots of work in our local community and we find that really important part of our practice too. Um, but I'm here to talk to you about cloudscapes. Um, we have a piece which is all about communal cloud gazing. It's about people being together and looking up at the sky. So it's a duologue, we call it, between the performer or, or a, an audio piece and the sky above. So it is literally all about the weather, which is something that's obviously come up quite a lot uh, in today's <laughs> conversations. Um, we have used this piece of work to make multiple pieces which have been appropriate for these incredibly weird times that we're living in. We've tried to be really playful online during lockdown. We've made m music and, and looked at other ways of communicating with audiences in our local neighbourhood. We've had over 100,000 people view different random things we've made um, and some of that wasn't my usual practice. So with Cloudscapes, what we decided to do was use some of that learning um, to uh, influence and um, show us how we could make our work more responsive to our audience and what the needs of the time are. Um, this is what Cloudscapes usually looks like. This is in Birmingham city centre. We're right by the bull outside um, Hollister, not very socially distanced. Um, but this is also what Cloudscapes look like. This is on the beach at 
at, um, I think it was the Festival of the Sky in Cleethorpes last year. So you can see with the right kind of space, it is a socially distanceable piece. During lockdown, therefore, we made Cloudscapes into, sorry, I'm talking really quickly, everybody, because I'm just trying to pack everything in. Some of the stuff we did as an example, we made Cloudscapes into a podcast because we figured that actually wherever you are, as long as you've got a view of the sky, even if you're ill and you're lying in your bed, as I was at the start of lockdown, I looked out of my bedroom window and could see the sky and could cloud gaze. And we ran some, or we're still running, in fact, digital Cloudscapes events. So we uh, worked with Blue Dot Festival, we worked with Pound Arts, which is Blue Sky and Beyond Festival, a festival of thrift we're working with, Arts by the Sea Festival, to do this digital cloud gazing. So we are still managing somehow to bring people outdoors, um, or that feeling of the outdoors, um, in their own homes. And that felt super important to me to enjoy and explore that um, natural world. I make work about earth sciences particularly, so that felt crucial. So we've collaborated on that. It is not the same, however, as being outside in space, which is what I was desperate to get back to. This is another picture of what Cloudscapes usually or used to look like with me as a performer. We worked with a festival in Italy which was really interesting for us because it was the first way of us getting out there again. We worked with a brilliant um, place uh, in uh, Northeast Italy who were coming out of lockdown just a couple of weeks before us. And we started to work on these ideas of how we could safely get out again into the world. Uh, this is a picture of me last, a couple of years ago on Bournemouth Beach. And this is the Italian version of Cloudscapes, which I directed over Zoom. And they were doing social distancing. Um, and we realized we had to do it all via headphones. So though we have a performer there, she had to do the piece on a headset without projecting. And the audiences are listening to her live performance over headphones. So that is certainly a way without projecting. With I, I make lots of music and, and uh, sing a lot as well. We can't, there's, there was problems at that time with the science of us doing that in outdoor space. So we realized that we could work with headphone technology. We did a run of 10 dates in Italy, which was great because we still did some international touring this year. Um, and then we have translated some of those findings into us getting out there again. So this is uh, last weekend, we were in Ulverston which in the UK is a really important place for street theatre because it's the home of Welfare State International and, and Sue and John. We went out with, we've been out twice with Cloudscapes already, communally cloud gazing with people in mainly green spaces. So we're in Salisbury Art Centre, a centre with Wiltshire Creative. And we have put a lot of things in place to make it really safe and for us to feel safe too with audiences. So we've done things like using the headphones. It's an audio piece. We have timed our audiences. Usually it's a bit of a free for all when we do the audio installation. We are open for say five hours, six hours a day where people kind of drift in and out and use the audio and we set them up. Actually, we've had to have timed audiences. Um, within our installation, we've made sure the distancing is really, really carefully done. If you're in a family bubble, you can gaze together and everything gets separated again. And we are sanitizing everything to within an inch of its life. So this is actually the, um, the artistic director of Salisbury Arts Centre, sanitizing plastic sheets that we put over our giant bean bags. It's it's been really hard work working out all of the steps in our risk assessment to make sure that we feel safe and that we feel audiences are safe and that and a crucial thing that our audiences are seen to be safe and that they we are demonstrating to them their safety. So at the start of each of the audiences coming into our site, we've made sure that they have um, a briefing, that they understand what measures we've put into place for them. That is absolutely crucial. For, um, for us putting our work out there. I want them to feel relaxed. I want them, if possible, to maybe fall asleep that they're so relaxed uh, while they're cloud gazing within this work. It's very meditative. Uh, if they don't feel safe, they don't feel relaxed. 
I've uh, talked about headphones. Sorry, I'm whizzing through. Uh, oh, we have a horse trailer as part of our work that usually I stand in. It's tiny and tell people about clouds at the end of the show. And we talk about the clouds that are in the sky at the moment. We've turned it into a museum that's walk throughable. So people kind of walk through, engage, don't touch anything. We put lots and lots of things in place. We used as a template, the NASA, um, not a template, but as a starting point for our risk assessment, the NASA guidance that they put out. We'll just say what NASA is so people don't think Sorry, it the NASA space. Association of Street Artists. Um, and that's a, that was a great document to start with. And because we're presenting at Greenwich and Docklands Festival uh, next weekend, they've been really supportive with us as well. So we've gone through lots and lots of um, iterations of this risk assessment, which is still live. And every time we've been out, we've then gone back and revisited our risk assessment. Um, Oh yes, my last slide. So basically what I wanted to say more than anything about these recent experiences being out there already is do not underestimate the impact that you have on your audience. Um, Cloudscapes is an emotional piece. It's about climate change. It's about um, the sky, how clouds are formed. It's also about me and my dad and, and it's a bit about death and grief and how things always change. I have stood in a field in Ulverston with many audience members and not just them be tearful and emotional, which I'm proud to say does sometimes happen. I have also stood there and cried with them. And being socially distant, I'm a hugger, you know, quite often with audiences, I have a cuddle. It's not been that at all. The intimacy that I feel I've shared with those audiences is very special and profound and um, an honor and also a weight. Um, and while we were in Ulverston, the moon was programmed. Luke Jerram's moon was in the Coro, in the Coronation Hall. And um, my family were up with me. We were in a bubble and we, we crewed the show together. And I sat in that auditorium because you could sit just up the top and observe it at very safe social distance. I cried my head off because I'd met all these people. So do not under, underestimate the toll that it might take on you as well as, as a performer somebody being out there again. We have been through this huge, extraordinary time and we're still finding our way out of it. I also I think getting out there is actually really positive and it's been brilliant and we need our intimate shared culture and our, our work where we get to be a community. That's also super important, but there's a great importance to it. So, yeah, be safe. It's been a journey and still is a journey, but it's been wonderful to be out there with people again. Uh, Great. The main thank thing. you. Thank you, <laughs> Lorna. Say. That's a rallying cry. So much adaptation and many different ways of adapting things that exist, but being creative with new, new ways of delivering. Thank you so very much, Lorna. Uh, so much to respond to, but I'm going to move on. Um, <laughs> so one of the first things I saw was, was uh, getting out there was, was Matt Pang. Uh, Matt, we, we first worked together when you were a student a hundred years or so ago, but you got out there on a bicycle very, very quickly in response to the current situation. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that, Matt. Yes, of course I can. Thanks for having me, Angus. Um, so, uh, my name is Matt Pang. I'm from Pang Gothic. Ordinarily, normally my show, I do uh, like small scale static shows. I'm just going to share my screen just so you get an idea. Oh, hold on. Uh, I'm not going to share. I'm going to share it. Yeah. No, I'm not going to share it because I can't do it. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, so, normally I do static shows uh, from everything from busking to festivals, so all kinds of outdoor arts, I kind of work across the whole range. Um, uh, and then lockdown happened. Uh, so I decided to build what I call the Happy Heart Bike, which is basically a kind of contraption um, that I built onto the back of a bike. My other shows, um, they all kind of use these weird chain reaction contraptions and ball runs and things like that. And um, lockdown happened and lots of people were kind of volunteering and lots of good people were doing good stuff basically to help how they could. And I was thinking, how as an artist, how as an outdoor artist, can I do something to help um, do something for my community? So uh, my idea was, well, I can make a smile. I know how to do that through performing and making things. So um, my thinking was, OK, I need to build something to get out to people. And it's purely built on practical terms in terms of... Um, okay, I'm allowed out to do exercise, so I can do it in my exercise allowance. Um, and it needs to be able to move fairly mobile, like mobile and quickly, so that I can reach as many people as possible. So I came up with a happy heart bike, which is like a pedal powered rolling ball or marble sculpture machine on the back of a bike. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, it's basically, it was a new show for me, but I was adapting the way I work a lot. I've never made a mobile show before, but because of COVID um, and the lockdown restrictions, um, it was kind of the only way I could get out and get to people. So I made quite a few adaptions to the way I work. So as I said, it's mobile. I could reach a lot of people. Some of the routes I was riding were kind of 10, 12 miles long, you know, five hour stints uh, going around the streets, um, reaching people. Um, who would obviously be staying on their doorsteps. Um, in terms of um, the actual performance style, the way I perform, there were quite a few things I needed to change in order to make it work and to make it safe. So um, normally when I perform, I don't speak in most of my shows. I am non-verbal, mostly because I work all across Europe. Um, so it makes it a lot easier and I communicate through gestures um, and things like that. And a lot of comedy comes out of that as well. But for this, Matt, I'm just going to share my screen while you talk. OK, <laughs> so um, specifically for this, I, um, I decided I was going to have to speak. Uh, one, because, oh, yeah, here's my little bike that Angus is showing you there. You can see the little thing uh, nicely got featured on the BBC. Um, so, yeah, I decided that I was going to have to speak. Um, one, because it would help me in a performance point of view. Um, relate to the audience quicker than if I was not speaking. I could build a rapport with them quicker um, and therefore get them on board. And I could also control them easier. I could tell them straight away kind of, um, you know, if they needed to move away or that, that those kind of things. Um, so that was one thing I had to adapt. Um, just looking through my notes. Um, I also, so I also knew that it had to be really visual and impact quickly to people so like when they saw it they were like whoa what's that and had a quick visual impact so that i could have an impact but then also move on to avoid two bigger crowds gathering and that kind of thing and so i also took into account as you can see from the video most of the contraption bike is above me uh mostly so that when i'm riding on the road that uh, people can see it over hedges they can see it over their front garden walls they can see it over cars and things like that um which uh, it was a great idea at the time, but then when I came to actually ride the bike, it caused me some issues, balancing issues, <laughs> but uh, that's another thing. Um, yeah, so obviously I was riding these routes around Bristol, which is where I live. Um, and I, this is, I'm kind of going to share how I built the routes basically, what, because I didn't just want to ride it around and just random people see it. That would be great to do. It's a great piece of street theatre. Um, but I wanted the impact to be bigger and it, to reach more people and people who need it as well. So what I did was I um, went into the Facebook groups um, of my local area and I posted a little video and said, hey, this is what I'm doing. If you'd like me to ride down your street, um, just comment in the comments underneath. So then I built up a database of all these streets that people wanted me to visit. And I then um, got all that. I kind of left that up for a week and then I got a map. I, put, I plotted a map on Google Maps. So I drew the route out on Google Maps and then I put different points of what basically where people had asked me to go. I put a point at that street and say what time I was expecting to be there. So I'd make this whole map with timings on it and where I was expecting to be at what time. I then created a Facebook event. I was using Facebook because it was just there. It was easy to do quickly. So I created a Facebook event and I put the map in there with the route and all the timings and any also all my safety information such as don't touch anything on the bike, please remain in your kind of garden or front garden or if you're on the pavement, make sure you're distanced from other audience members, other people on the street. Um, uh, yeah, I think it was like, and there's things like, and also I had a link, I'd done a risk assessment just for my own peace of mind. So I um, had a risk assessment as well on there so they could see that if they wanted. So I then created the event and then shared the event. Um, and I made sure that that got posted in the groups and was circulated amongst those groups and would tell people to, you know, uh, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your neighbours that the Happy Park Bar Bike is coming to your street this weekend. Um, yeah, so that's basically how I communicated with the most of my audience. I kind of two audiences, the audiences that knew I was coming and the audience that did not know I was coming, who were just kind of uh, happening upon me as I was riding around. So it's just important to note that I, I, another reason I was speaking in the show was that so that I had a way of controlling those people and this, those people who were just coming across it to avoid big crowd building and that kind of thing. Um, yes. So, um, yeah, 
So let's talk a little bit about audience reactions. Um, generally, people were stuck in the houses. They had nothing else to do. They absolutely, the, it was so positive riding around my local community. It was um, incredible, basically. Everyone was so positive. You have kids talking to you, asking about the bike. Um, you know, so, and then I get messages from people saying that my kids have been in the garage rumming around, rummaging around. They want to add stuff onto their bike. You know, it was great. I could see it was having a positive impact, which was brilliant. I was expecting some kind of some negative stuff, you know, saying you shouldn't be out, you're blocking the road, blah, blah, blah. Um, I didn't actually have any of that. The police went past me a few times and I was kind of like, are they going to say something? They're not. They kind of just drove past smiling out of their windows at me. One police car stopped. They got out and took some selfies with me. It was just um, uh, overall very positive, which was great. Um, the other thing that was great about it was I was reaching... Um, uh, my local community and people who were definitely not arts attenders so that was really important to me that I was reaching people who would not normally attend outdoor arts or theatre or anything like that um, so it was great to be reaching those kind of people as well who are local to my community and when the lockdown uh, lifted a little bit and I could drive so drive my bike somewhere I would go to an area that I knew was a slightly more deprived area and do routes around those areas so that I could uh, reach out even more um, Cool. Matt, just... This is brilliant. Can I can I move on? Just quite one more case study to share. This yeah, is so okay. brilliant, though. It, it, you've really given us a great picture of that. It, it's just fantastic. Uh, and all the, I love that all the maps were available on your website, so you could. Yeah, it, it, it was a different approach. Really, really good. They're still there. Um, you... It's still there. Fantastic. Um, well, your your website was at the, at the top of this. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, Ajay, Ajay. I wonder if you talk us a little bit about uh, Nutcut. Thank you, Angus. Hi, everyone. I'll try and be as brief as possible. And I'm sorry to rush you. I'm sorry to rush you, Ajay. No, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. Um, really great to be part of this forum and to see so many friends and uh, clearly lots of people um, all engaged in making sure we can all make a difference in some, in some way for ourselves, our families and our communities. Um, I just wanted to start off by giving some... Uh, a wider context to to where we're at. So my name's Ajay Chabra from I'm one half of Nutcut. Five members of my family, we lost five members of my family as a direct result of COVID over the last four months, um, including my mum, right at the start of lockdown. Um, I, we've been in and out of A&E wards, COVID wards, care homes, crematoriums, and next week to the open sea, to the Thames estuary for an ashes ceremony. This reminded me and us of um, the stories of our lives, of those that we lost. Um, and it encouraged us to think of different ways to storytell. Um, we were invited to participate in, a, in a, an online digital festival to create a new piece of work, a short piece of digital film work. And um, our, uh, we completely, um, responded by the rites of passage and it reminded us as Nutcut, Simi and I, why we started Nutcut in the first place um, just almost 20 years ago uh, where we brought the private into the public. So we, with a very small team, we, we created a, a short film which I'll, I'll show you shortly. I'll show you 30 seconds of it. It's available on our YouTube site which um, please feel free to click on. It's 17 minutes long. Um, as a result of making this film, we um, then created for ourselves. We ended up creating filming guidelines in the outdoor space with tips and tricks um, and helping other like-minded people in supporting them in making digital content. The important thing for us was to make the digital con content with people surrounded by people. So it was important for us to not to do it in some isolated landscape, but to find clever ways in which to put our performers and our stories into the heart of where people naturally gather. So in this instance, it was a open air, part open air, uh, public uh, market. Um, so we've been, we've been looking at all the different ways to storytell. The, the live experience will never disappear for us. Uh, at the heart of what we do is, is Mela. Mela means to meet or to gather. And so we're really looking forward to a, a moment where we go back to that, that moment of gathering. But in the meantime, we're finding different ways to storytell. 
The film that we made is called Sans, it, it means breath, um, and we used uh, uh, 23 CCTV cameras and a very small um, film crew. Intergeneral, intergenerational stories have been really important for us uh, and finding appropriate outdoor spaces. Um, the audience response was overwhelming. It, it, the, the, the filming, the filming when we were filming live in situ, it was, um, uh, it was very interesting because we were in a, in a market where people buy and sell. Um, and we're not expecting dancers to be filming a, a narrative. So but that, that, was, that went down really well. The stallholders, the shopkeepers, we're arranging a screening for them in the place in which the film was made. And finally, I just wanted to say that all, all, what we're doing over the, the future of Nutka at the moment is we're creating the world's first VR Mela. And we're, we're doing that in November and it'll be an immersive experience um, which, which we're ensuring that there's a sort of democracy about it. So we don't, one doesn't need the VR headsets and all of the tech in order to engage with it, but there are different ways. We've always made work for, Simi and I have always made work for our parents who are, are not, not from this country. English isn't their first language. They don't book seats to go and see a piece of theater. They don't go to outdoor festivals, but they do other stuff. And, that, and that's always been the first lens in which we make our work. So the VML is kind of aimed at them, but they're hopefully have a sort of more universal appeal. Um, I'm going to show you, Angus, do I have 30 seconds to show you? Yep, great. Do I'll it. just screen share. SARS, which means breath, is a series of three four-minute films that we've filmed here in Queen's Market in East London, in the London borough of Newark. It's a market that I'm familiar with. I've been coming here since I was a child. And it was important for us to tell a story, a universal story, of the life of one woman seen through three different stages of her life. As a child, as a woman in the prime of her life, and as a mature woman in the later stages of her life. And I think we wanted to make a film in the space that was familiar, in a place that was familiar, but to take the ordinary into the extraordinary. We've used a day in the market as a metaphor. Done. I'll put the link in the chat. That's good. Thank you. Yeah, the, there's the link there to, to, to where people can see it all. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Lorna, for that last section. So many different ways of responding. Um, just incredible. I'm, I'm actually welling up. Uh, right, better go on my bike and go to Greenwich and Docklands and see some stuff. Um, I think there's a really interesting conversation that's been going on uh, that Dee initiated about diversity and what's going on at the moment in terms. One of the big things, look, this is only the beginning of this. I, I was really interested to see, I was very pleased that I couldn't get some tickets for some GDIF stuff because it was for local people only. There's the beginnings of that thought. That's not in any way the answer to it, but that's the beginning of that, uh, some of that conversation that especially if things do become booked online, then we're guaranteeing, you know, only audiences with access, et cetera, et cetera. Really important stuff. I just, that's a, a very brief um, uh, res response to that. I'm just gonna bung up some, for those of you still here, some of the resources that I just want to share with you there in the chat. There's our resource page at the top there, um, where you'll find uh, various links uh, externally, but also all the stuff that we've prepared, including the stuff we prepared for the DCMS about how we get back outdoors. Uh, our events listing page, I talked about that earlier. Then the bookable shows directory, if there are people here who are looking for things that are COVID friendly, ready to go, there they, there they lie. Our consultants directory, which includes lots of people who can help you through this. Uh, this was mentioned in the events industry forum guidance, very, very useful. And the National, National Association of Street Artists Risk Assessment Guide. The only reason I asked you to say that, Lorna, is because somebody went, I've been on the NASA website and I can't find anything about street arts, only about rocket fuel, which um, could be useful in these crazy times. Um, so there's those. Um, yeah, we've got a busy old day on Zoom today, so I'm just going to find out one last lot of links. Um, so let me just delete that. There we go. Uh, so here you've got... Um, where have I started? Okay, at two o'clock today, if you want to see some artists pitching from the UK and the Netherlands and beyond, uh, you can join us. Uh, we will be working with the Spoffin Festival and GDIF 
I'm moderating that. That's at two o'clock uh, for about an hour. And then there's some breakout rooms. You're welcome to join that. Uh, I've just put the direct link there. Um, we have a weekly drop in, uh, and that's indeed today. Like I say, a long day on Zoom at four o'clock today. Uh, today, interestingly, Martin Green, who many of you will know as director of uh, ceremonies at the Olympic Games in London, and also director of uh, creative director of Hull 2020, which year was it? I've forgotten already. 20 it's City Culture 2017, 18, 2, 12, don't know. You know who I mean. Anyway, he's now director of Festival 2022, a number I can remember, which uh, was invented by Theresa May and has been carried on by Boris Johnson. Oh my God, it'd be interesting to hear about that. What more? I need to say no more. If you think you belong in those directories, uh, there are the links there to sign up to the uh, various directories. And um, one final thing, if I can just do one final bit of cut and paste from the correct document, uh, which would be that one. Um, we also, uh, if you want to stay in touch with us, there's just a few little easy ways to do that. Um, you can book one-to-ones on Thursdays with myself and usually a member of the board. Uh, uh, there's the booking there. I think they're all sold out at the moment. We'll put some more up uh, shortly. Do follow us on the Twitter Pro account. That's where we will put any extra resources, funding opportunities, commissioning opportunities. So that's Outdoor Arts Pro. And then the one where we track events is Outdoor Arts UK. Uh, that's our two main Twitter. We have Facebook. There's a COVID uh, Outdoor Arts group that we also moderate. Uh, and there's our email. Please, anything else to add to that, please do. Thank you once again to the speakers who are still with us and also a nod to Vicky and Ray who are off doing other things. So useful. We have recorded this. We will be sharing this beyond. Uh, and please do come see us later if, you, if you'd like to join us at, at four o'clock or at two o'clock. We'd be delighted to see you. Uh, look, we're on 100 again. Right. A few have snuck away. Thank you all so very much. Uh, do save the chat if you want, but we will put that online as well. Thanks a lot, everybody. Adios.